Radio Show. Starring Tom Tharp, the author, and Joe Bucci, the dolphin trainer. They're going to talk your socks off about everything cool in the automotive world. Welcome, Tom and Joe. Hey, everyone. Welcome to the Tom and Joe Auto Show, episode number four. All right, episode four, moving right along. Yeah, here we are. So uh, up front, I'm an author. I think I think that's enough said, don't you think? I mean, that's I'm an author. I'm the author, I guess. Yeah, well, yeah, you are, t- Tom, the author. Um, the author. I suppose I like if somebody was interesting and interested in your works, they could Google it, maybe. Yeah, just w- where you would find authory stuff. Look for my name in there, and I'll I'll be promptly listed up top. I'm sure. Yeah, I, I'd expect yeah. that definitely. Easy to find. Easy to find. <laughs> All right, and yeah, I I am um, the dolphin trainer. I like yours. Yeah, it's it's fun work. Yeah, I can't make that up. Get to wear a wetsuit. Yeah, who doesn't want to wear we a just, wetsuit? <laughs> we just watched a dolphin tail with the kids, which was filmed right up the road from you. Yep. And uh, I imagine I think I might have seen you in that movie actually somewhere, <laughs> uh, holding the dolphin or riding it or something. You were in it. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I was. <laughs> All right, well, let's get started. We've got some cool topics here. Um, you know, New Year's is almost upon us. New Year's Eve will be here real soon, celebrating the new year, 2015, coming in. So we've got New Year's resolutions for the car guy. Oh, yeah, even car guys have resolutions. Yeah, you need some. You know, start with a clean slate. It's a good It's a good time to do so. And I've got a couple here. Let me rattle off mine real quick, Joe. Okay. I've got the first is is I want to have more patience. And what I found over the years is when I, before I just jump into a job, whether it be a small job or something a little more involved, if I just stop and do a little more reading and a little more thinking and a little more planning, that the end result is always much better. That's definitely true. So I found, I mean, even sometimes the stops are unnatural. It's due to a part that's on back order or something. And just that time to think is just, I find, produces a better end result. And I found that in my career as well. So that's number one, to just to have more patience and to stop and think and plan a little more. Okay. And uh, so good luck to me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the second one is to learn some new things. And that's always, I think, all car guys try to do that. But I want to do something completely different and out of my comfort zone this year. Oh, okay. Uh, so, that should be interesting. But, yeah, so that's I think that's part of resolutions is to challenge yourself a little bit and uh, y- you know put yourself out there. Yeah, I feel like that's like the definition of the New Year's resolution is a challenge. Yep. Yep. So yeah, that's good. Um, I think that like you would think typical car guy resolutions like I need to be better at maintenance with my car, making sure that it's in tip top shape, and I need to make sure that I finish these projects I start that sort of thing, but. I'm going to go with, as my New Year's resolution, I want to make it to more racing events. Ooh, that's a great one. Yeah, I think that, um, especially since I'm going to be busy working on my project car, it's not really going to be ready this year anytime. Uh, So I'm just going to go watch other people race and look at their setups and get ideas and things like that. I think it's uh, going to be a lot of fun to do that. Yep, lots to learn and good motivation from doing that as well. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, last year I made it to a couple events. Um, and there's a couple events that I missed out and, and I regretted it. So I'm going to not regret that this year. Yeah, I skipped an event locally here at Bristol. It was Nopi, which I wasn't real crazy about just because of the general Nopi vibe. But um, right. I am sad that I missed that show and should have went. But I did go to the shootout, and I'll definitely be going again this year. So uh, that's a good one. Maybe I'll I'll steal that one too from you, Joe, and uh, try to hit some more events this year. All right, that's cool. I can share it. <laughs> okay, you got any others, or is that the big no, one? No, that's it right there. That's That's my New Year's resolution for a car guy. Okay. All right, folks. If you have a New Year's resolution, send them along. We'd like to hear yours as well. And uh, with wrapping that one up, let's move on to some other topics. And uh, the first I have is the Polaris Slingshot. Do you know much about that, Joe? Um, I didn't know that much about it, but when you had mentioned it to me, I did a little bit of research, and uh, I, I found it pretty interesting, actually. Something about it being banned, and I'm trying to figure out exactly where that comes from. I know, banned in two states. It's been banned in Texas and Connecticut, which Texas really blows my mind. Uh, 
I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, they don't really like free, they don't ban anything there, do it's they? A free, <laughs> it's a free for all down there, <laughs> and here they are banning the poor innocent Polaris slingshot and. The slingshot itself is a very interesting vehicle. I mean, I totally bought into the hype when it first uh, came out when they started releasing teaser picks and information. Yep. And I just think it's an interesting vehicle that the whole sort of melding of like a Formula One car and a motorcycle and it's affordable and, you know, has a warranty and uses parts that are reliable and such. I mean, it uses the 2.4 liter GM Ecotec four cylinder, right. which is a great engine. Yep. Which, you know, where my mind went and immediately when I saw that they were using that engine. Where do you think? Turbochargers? <laughs> exactly, turbocharger. I mean, that Ecotec is just proven, a, you know, from back in the day, you and I talk about this a lot, how it was a proven drag strip set up yeah. back in the uh, import drag days yep. uh, when GM was into it real big. But so anyway, it's 173 horsepower and 166 pound-feet of torque. So, you know, good setup. Uh, you know, got the, got the one wheel in the back, kind of weird, but from uh, right. everything I've read so far, it handles good. It's a good car. Now, what do you think one of those things weighs, if you had to guess? Oh, boy. If I had to guess, um, I'd probably, I'd say about 1,200 pounds. That's a good guess. It's a little porkier than that. It's 1743 oh, wow. is the curb weight. Yeah, so that's, that's pretty you heavy. Know, with the, yeah, it is. It is for... for and, you know, folks were, when they first saw it and before the specs came out, the weight and all that, folks were saying, oh, man, it's going to run tens in the quarter mile. <laughs> yeah. And that, that to me, might be some of this confusion with states banning it because I did a little calculating, you know, mm -hmm. as I like to do, Joe. And if you put a, uh, you know, just a regular 150-pound guy in there and given the horsepower and the weight of that thing, you're looking at a mid-13 on a good day in the quarter mile. Right, yeah. That's not that quick, really, for something like that. No, not that quick. And, you know, it's, I'd say it's about right for the price and everything. Yeah. But, I mean, you can go – imagine what you can buy in the sport bike realm. Oh, yeah, for the for the price they're getting for this <laughs> thing, which, I don't know, it's about 20 grand, right? Yeah, yeah. Give her, yeah, um, it says uh, starts at nineteen ninety nine for the base model and twenty four for the SL, and it goes up a little if you want some other little doodads and such. Right. Okay. Man, yeah, that's not a lot of performance for the dollar. I don't think. No, no, and um, I mean, but for a motorcycle, God, the performance you can get for half that, even. Yeah, definitely. Woo! Amazing. You know what I wonder so, is. I don't know anything about the performance of it, but this this vehicle, this slingshot, what it reminds me of right off the bat is the Can-Am Spider. Yes. Um, of course, the Spider is definitely more of a motorcycle, I would say, than this is. <laughs> yeah, it's like an upright motorcycle kind of setup. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what the performance is like in that thing, but I know it's priced about the same, and it, I mean, it's a three-wheel, I mean, I guess that's where the similarities end, but... Yeah, I, I see lots that. of those around too. Those uh, Can Ams, I see those all the time down here. Yep, I see a bunch of them too. Yep. So, um, okay, well, so I don't know. I, I guess we'll just have to wait and see on the uh, on that vehicle and see what happens. I mean, I just still can't believe they're getting banned, but but I I do look forward to seeing how they evolve that platform. I mean, Polaris, obviously, their brand speaks for themselves, and they build so much awesome stuff. Um, I could see them evolving into a turbo version, or I, so that's what I'm interested in. It's just seeing folks what they do to them. I mean, I know folks will be slapping on turbos and superchargers and stuff just yep. because of the Ecotec engine being so uh, flexible. Right. Yeah. So cool vehicle for sure. Um, I've got another one for you here, Joe. Okay. And I know I I, I might have brought this up on every single show, <laughs> but the but the the specs and more information, photos and such have come out on the 2016 CTSV by Cadillac. Oh, man, what a great car. <laughs> <laughs> yep, and the specs are out. Obviously, it's got that LT4 V8 from the uh, Corvette Z06. The ratings in this particular vehicle, a little less uh, than in the Corvette, but still impressive. 640 horsepower and 630 pound-feet of torque. Oh, boy. Oh, man. Proposed top speed of 200 miles per hour. That's just Yowzers. crazy. I know. I know. There's all kind of wild specs on this thing. Um they're saying that it's going to include a carbon fiber hood, um, a variety of other carbon fiber bits. So they're, they're keeping an eye on the weight, which to me, that was a big turnoff of the old CTSV was just the weight. You know, it was a giant thing. Yeah, definitely. But, uh, you know, the, the regular CTSV sports and stuff, they've 
knocked hundreds of pounds off the previous CTS platform and this new platform they have. Right. So uh, I don't know. It's pretty exciting. Uh, you know, I was trying to sort of think about what the performance could be, but th- I mean, they're, they've already posted a zero to sixty time in the press release. It says three point seven seconds, which so is pretty that's not- fast in a big sedan like that. I know rear wheel drive, big sedan. You know, there was rumors that they might try all wheel drive or something along that line, but uh, not yet. Anyway, maybe in the future. But an impressive car. The only downside is you're going to have to sell a kidney, Joe. It's it's looking really expensive. <laughs> yeah, I saw a figure starting at around eighty thousand dollars. Woo! Ow! Ow! Yeah, that hurts the wallet. Ow. Oh my goodness! But but I mean, this is a natural move for Cadillac. You know, they've hired a new CEO. They're moving in this upmarket direction. Um, to me, the old CTSV performance level is now taken up by the revised ATSV. Yes, I agree. And I read a little bit about that and the fact that the ATSV allowed Cadillac to go a little bit uh, more upscale, bigger, better, badder on the CTSV. And I think that's great. Yep. So it's you can just sort of see the models moving. You know, they're. You know they're they're just sort of moving them up a little each uh, to compete with others and to I don't know to me when I look at the specs on this it's a very unique thing I don't see it as them trying to compete with A or B it just seems like a very unique piece of machinery yeah Pretty exciting it's funny because I see that uh, a lot of the articles I read about it they're trying to compare it to the Mercedes E sixty three AMG and the BMW M five and I I don't know I feel like those cars are a lot more money than this car even. yeah. Um, yes, and the yes, performance definitely. the performance isn't as good. Um, I was reading that those cars are are hundreds of pounds heavier than the CTSV. Sure, um, I don't know. It doesn't. I think Cadillac really nailed it here. It doesn't even seem like a comparison to me. I know, and I hate to sound like a homer, but <laughs> uh, I love all sorts of cars from all over. But I'm with you. I think they're doing a very unique, interesting, doing their own thing, and uh, I hope they keep doing that. Same with the ATSV. It's just a really interesting car. Yeah, it um, is. Yeah. So one more quick news topic, Joe. I'm springing this one on you here. Okay. Okay. I, re- I read about um, so Ford. You know, Ford Racing and Ford Performance. They've all always impressed me with their line of parts that they offer, and I'm sure you and how they support the enthusiasts and stuff. And I'm sure you saw this at PRI to some degree. Yeah, I definitely did. But they have a huge presence at SEMA. I had never seen anything like their setup at SEMA as far as performance goes. I mean, they just had a massive part of the building, and uh, I'm not sure if it was the same at PRI, but still very impressive nonetheless. And specifically, you know, we were talking a little bit about their um, their their EcoBoost engines and such, and they are now offering their, let's see, what's the name of this thing? ProCal handset for $595, which is okay. a reflashing It's a reflashing tool that you can buy directly from them. Yeah, I did hear a little bit about that. Yeah, and you get the warranty, you know, your warranty is intact as long as you use their reflashing tool. And this isn't just something that gives you, you know, 10 horsepower and 15 foot-pounds of torque. I got numbers here that in the, let's see, the 1.6 liter Fiesta ST, 90 foot-pound boost in torque at the crank. (laughs) Wow. That's, I tell you what, man, that's aggressive. (laughs) I mean, and uh, I mean, so, I mean, there's all sorts of numbers in here. Um, And 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 from what I read, the the, the 2.3 EcoBoost and the Mustang, they're in the works for you know, producing that for the uh, Mustang as well, which I'm sure we'll see awesome gains along yeah, that line. Yeah. But, but coming out strong, man, and you get the warranty with it, and, you know, it doesn't uh, – I don't see a downside. I mean, in Ford, to me, this is a natural thing for them to stay ahead of this and be an innovator, but um, I don't know. I just thought that was a really promising thing. Yeah, that's great. I, I uh, Ford's come a long way, you know, and without getting into too much of the political part of it, they've come a long way without any help. And uh, I, I I support what they're doing there and, and reaching into the performance aftermarket with OEM parts, I think, is a great thing. That goes back to what we were talking about, about GM when they were big in the drag racing. Um, they had performance packages they were offering for some of their vehicles too, build books and that sort of thing. And I just Love think that's it. great. Yep, and my, my the only thing I think is missing from Ford is a Corvette-style vehicle. And uh, I mean, 
I don't know. There's rumors at Detroit this year they might be doing something along that line. Uh, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see on that one. But uh, anyway, lots of new cars. They're supposed to be bringing some new edition Mustangs, which there's always many, many flavors of Mustangs that Ford does. But I'd love to see him do something with a little bit different platform. Yeah, uh, I agree. The Mustang, people sometimes try to compare the Mustang to the Corvette because yeah, Ford I, I've doesn't. Yeah, never got that. Yeah, Ford just doesn't yeah. have anything for it. What they need to do is is put together a Corvette priced uh, uh, GT40. That's what they need to do. Oh my gosh. Oh, oh, that would be so amazing. Uh, love the GT40. Okay, quick thing. Um, everybody, keep your eye out for the Tokyo Auto Salon, which is um, January, starts on January 9th, which that's sort of the first car show this season. And that is where you'll see the wildest stuff. It's my favorite just because it's so crazy. I mean, if you love import cars, uh, already, there's some press releases out, uh, Honda and some others. Honda has something, I believe it's called the N-Box. <laughs> I'm not okay, sure if you've yeah. seen this. It's like a tiny van. Right, okay. Um, and they've come out with like five or six different flavors of that that they're going to be bringing to that show. And uh, just awesome, wild, weird, uh, head-scratching <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just it's the it's just such a fun show, and uh, there's usually some really good stuff there too. Maybe something on the uh, new NSX. I don't know. It's hard to know, but that'll be yeah. coming out real soon. So everyone, keep an eye out for that show coming up. Yeah, that sounds like that's going to be good. Japanese car culture is always very interesting on the cutting oh, edge. Yes, love it. All right, Tom. Well, let's take a quick break. Um, we'll uh, come back with uh, some information about how you can reach us on our social media outlets and uh, have a couple more topics for you. All right. Sounds good. everybody welcome back um we need some questions we need listener questions if you could go to our facebook at facebook.com forward slash the tom and joe show or visit us on twitter at tom t and joe b um send your questions to us and uh we'll get them answered on the show for you how's that sound tom Sounds good. No question too big or too small. We've already got some great ones, and we're going to um, get on a few of those later in the show here. But please send us anything and everything. We'd love to see it. All right, cool. Um, our first topic here in the second half of the show, um, we're going to talk about car magazines. Um, a, man. a subject very near and dear to my heart. Yeah, me, me too, Tom. Tom and I are both big car magazine guys have been since we were teenagers kids oh, oh man uh it, it's just such a big part of my childhood i mean growing up in the service station we had car magazines everywhere i would just sit and look at them i mean all the way through high school we would gather around in homeroom in high school and just look at the test every month the car and driver the motor train whatever would come out we would get it and just huddle around it for just days and days <laughs> until we just wore it out I oh mean, yeah the Oh, so it was just our favorite thing, and I have a lot of fond memories of car magazines. Yeah, I used to do the same thing. I used to get my Car and Driver magazine, and in the back, I'd go right to the back and look for the Road Test Digest. Mm, my favorite my favorite part. We spent so many hours in homeroom and in high school bench racing over that <laughs> Road Test Digest. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that was man. fun stuff. But the question, Tom, is... How long are magazines going to be around in their paper form? You know, you got people mm -hmm. using, uh, I use Zinio. I get Motor Trend Magazine See, through I've Zinio. I've never even heard of that. I've never, Zin, what the hell? <laughs> I've never even heard of that. It's just oh, an, an I've app. I've never heard of that. It's an app that allows you to subscribe to magazines and, and read them on your computer or on your tablet or phone or whatever you want to uh, read them on. It's great. Oh, okay. It's like Bluegar. I use Bluegar. Okay, okay. No, I made that up. See, oh. see how easy that is to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, wow! <laughs> <laughs> oh shoot! I hope that dot com isn't taken. Blueguard dot com. That's a good one. You got something there. <laughs> uh, anyway, point taken. I tell you, you know, I have a little background in the print industry, and oh, 
to me, it's, it really still amazes me that printed car magazines are even available. I hate to say that. I know it. I know it. But there is just like a just like some people reading a paper book. It's just using a Kindle is not the same, and it goes the same way for the magazines too, man. To get it in your mailbox, be excited. Oh, bring man, it into the is... bathroom with you. <laughs> <laughs> that is the best day when I open up that uh, the mailbox and there's that car magazine. Oh my gosh, it makes me so happy. You know, I could get an email saying. Hey, click here. Your new car and driver has arrived via electronically. Eh, no. Or get the little number on the icon saying yep. there's something in the app. No, 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 no. That's what when happens to in, me. Oh, man. When it's, a, yeah, through uh, Grabu or whatever that app yeah, is called. Yeah, that one. When, when you go, I don't know, there's just something about seeing it. Just, you don't, you know, you just see it kind of curled up in your mailbox. And you're like, ooh. And uh, my wife calls them mangazines. That's her name for them. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Any of the, any, you know, like some racing catalog or, right. or, you know, these magazines I get, anything like that is, cat- is categorized as a mangazine. But, um, oh, I just love, you know, I got one here in front of me. My favorite right now, I, I get Car and Driver, I get Motor Trend. Uh, I think Motor Trend might have stopped, but uh, my favorite's Hot Rod. I just get so much, um, I love the colors and the photography. And just the there's so much to see in each uh, issue, and uh, that's my favorite right now. I get lots of inspiration and ideas, and it just gets my wheels turning looking through all the pages of Hot Rod right now. Yeah, that's definitely a good magazine. You get some of the newer school stuff, but really what I love about Hot Rod magazine is the old school stuff that just holds true forever. <laughs> yep, that's right. That's right, and, and maybe that's why I like it so much. But I tell you, honestly, I spend a fair amount of time going through my old car magazines. Oh yeah. I, I have, I have amassed an amazing collection <laughs> and, uh, I mean, you see them in my videos. I always post, uh, you know, I'll, I'll shoot a little video of some of my old magazines and stuff and refer to them, but I really do love looking at old car magazines too and just comparing them to current day and it's just a lot of fun, but there's just yeah, a permanence. There's a permanence to a magazine or a book that I just don't feel is there with an electronic version, you know? Yeah, I definitely agree. It, it's there's something lacking for sure in the electronic versions, um, and I don't know if it's just uh, if we're showing our age by still holding on to the paper magazines, or uh, if that's something that's that even the younger generations, you know, are holding on to. Do, do they really enjoy holding a magazine in their hands, or are they perfectly fine with a tablet version? Hmm, I don't know. I. It's hard to know. I'm trying to think about my kids and books, and they seem to like them both ways. I, um, I don't know. There's just such an intimate experience that I think I have with when I'm looking, flipping through a magazine, and I can take it everywhere and everything. But I have an iPad, and I get things on there. And um, but I just, to me, I knowing a little bit about publishing, I just think about the process and the people involved and the the materials it takes to actually print something like this and thousands or millions of them. Right. And it seems just like a crazy amount of process and waste. <laughs> yeah, it does. And that may be why, like one of the reasons I electronically subscribe to Motor Trend is it's like four ninety nine a year. Yeah, mm, that's, that's pretty good. That's affordable. <laughs> See, that's a strong argument. That, that, that alone... Yeah, could be the that could be the final nail in the coffin. It's just the costs keep going down of the electronic version, while the cost just keeps going up of the print version. Yep. Oh boy. Yeah, I even see the quality on some print magazines going down. They're becoming yes. more newspaper like. Yep, I've seen that too. Yeah, that's too bad. But uh, it'd be interesting to see what happens in the next ten years. Hey, and just a quick tip for everybody: if you ever just if you want to just have some serious fun and fun in my opinion but i think you'd enjoy it too it's just go on craigslist and there's always some people selling a big or or even ebay there's always some people selling a big lot of old car magazines and what i've usually found is it's not necessarily one type they'll just have a box from a certain era right okay and you know like there'll be a guy's you know a ton of car magazines from the the mid 70s to early 80s 20 bucks yeah that that's worth 20 bucks or less even (laughs) and you just go and you meet the weird guy and you get the magazines and i mean you you just 
I can't describe how much fun that is for me it's just to go through and I've done that a few times and that's how I built up the old collection downstairs but um, All right. that's a fun thing to do yeah that sounds cool for sure okay <laughs> well I don't know if we've that one is yet to be determined but boy I just can't imagine car magazines in the printed form lasting too much longer yeah I agree with that it's too bad <sighs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> so let's move on. Now, we have a new segment here, Joe. Yeah, this is something that we've talked about and uh, something that we'll probably do more of in the future. Yeah, and this is fun for any car guy, I think. You know, that one of my favorite shows that sort of came and went was Pastime. You remember that one, Joe? Oh, yeah, I remember that. It was good. Yeah, that was filmed in your backyard, wasn't it? Yeah, some of the episodes were. Yeah, that's right. They moved around a little bit. But yeah. Uh, yeah, Bradenton Motorsports Park. And what a cool show where they would, for the folks that haven't seen it, you know, they would, a car would roll up uh, to, the, it'd be at a drag strip. And the uh, contestants had to guess what they thought the car would run in the quarter mile just by looking at it. And the owner sort of giving a sort of vague description of what it had <laughs> done to it. And uh, <laughs> I loved it. I loved to play at home. I just thought that was the best show. And, um, so anyway, past, this is sort of pastime style. So what I'm going to do, Stump the Chump is, you know, we're going to give each other some specs and some information about a car, and we have to see how close we can get to on guessing its quarter mile performance. Right, Joe? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can do it. Okay. Who, who do you want to go first? Uh, let me go first here. I got, uh, I got something sitting right in front of me. I'm ready to go. <clears throat> and yeah, sounds good. I'm dying to give you these specs on this vehicle. Okay. All right. Now, so can I ask questions? <laughs> Um, sure. You're, you're welcome to, and I'll answer with what I, what I can give you from the information okay. I have. Okay, good, good. All right. So here, what I have is a 2010 Ford Fusion SEL. Oh, goodness. Okay. Um, a couple, uh, I'll give you a couple quick, uh, specs on it. It has a 75 horsepower NX wet shot on it. What? <laughs> Why it has, would you do that? <laughs> it has a Steeda intake on it. Apparently, Steeda makes an intake for it. Lay. And it looks like they're running some Eibach Pro Kit springs and some Nexen radial tires. Yikes. This is front-wheel drive, right? This is a front-wheel drive vehicle, yes. Yeah. What do you What do you got? Uh, like an underdrive pulley? You got a... Uh, I don't know. What else you got? You got a header on that thing? What uh, else you got? It, it, a, it says it has a Magnaflow exhaust. Oh boy! Um, all, right. all right, some kind of cat back job. Um, yeah, it doesn't really specify. It doesn't say it has any kind of headers, downpipe, midpipe. So this, did you say? I'm sorry. Did you say it was a V6 or a four cylinder? Oh, hey, that's a good question. Um, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh. Wow, it's not specified. Not specified. This. Oh, this is hard. This is this, this is, is yeah. You're killing me here, Joe. It does say. I'll give you one more thing. The one last specification here That's is insane. that it has a uh, a computer or ECU chip upgrade. It's an SCT X4. Why? Well, it sounds like you just made up some letters and numbers. <laughs> it's Zinio Zinio magazine reader. <laughs> okay, well that's worth right. some power, I'm sure. Um, okay. So this is actual quarter mile performance. Yeah, there's a time slip here I'm looking at to go with the vehicle I just spec'd out to you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, 1489 at 97 miles an hour. All right. All right. Um, I'm thinking it's a V6. I could be wrong. Yeah, you know what? I can't tell. There is actually a picture, but oh. <laughs> you can't really see it. <laughs> anyway. Plastic well, engine cover. The actual quarter mile et on this vehicle is 13.915 whoa nice and the mile per hour is 101 miles per hour oh uh, nice i like it cool sleeper you know you who would guess that yeah yeah i wouldn't have thought it was that quick yeah busting out a third like a real world 13.9 at the track yeah that'd be fun yeah this time slip is dated december 25th is that that, that must be when they posted it <laughs> Boom, busting out the Christmas, the track rental, Christmas track rental. Wow. Oh, boy. Anyway, <laughs> that's that. <laughs> okay, well, darn, darn. I, I, I was heading towards Sleeperville because I had one as a rental car, and it felt like the slowest thing I'd ever driven. But uh, <laughs> So I was thinking, man, it's going to take some serious oomph to make that thing go. But that's pretty good. Yeah, not bad. Okay. This is – all right, here we go. All right, this is an old – now this is I like this. This is a classic. 
<laughs> Let's see here. I'm keeping you in suspense. You are. <laughs> okay, this is an old um, Firebird convertible, 67. Okay. All right. Now, it's the whole... Um, I'll give you a good bit of info. It's, given the, it's been given the resto mod kind of treatment. Right. All right. So, really clean looking, really clean and factory looking. But, you know, there's still something else going on here. Um, sorry, I'm paging through. The information's kind of spread out throughout the article. But it's got a... Um, Let's see, it's got a 460 cubic inch stroker V8. Um, let's see. Yeah, that's a good old Pontiac V8 there. Right, okay. Okay, so a nice 460 cubic inch. It's a, so it's the Pontiac 400, stroke to 460. 10.3 uh, compression. Um, let's see here, the rear wheel horsepower. I'm going to give you an actual number. 400, wow. 413 horsepower at 5,400 RPM. Okay. Now, the 400 is a torque monster. Yeah. This thing's pushing 550 pound-feet at 3,400. <laughs> okay. This is a cool... This is red. It's got the awesome little tack on the hood. Right. Uh, really nice car. Red interior. Really cool car. Um, so, uh, so y any other information you need? Oh, it's a... Uh, let's see. Transmission. It's an automatic. Okay. Well, I think... Um Drag radials. As the Stump the Chump segment uh, becomes reoccurring, recurring, sorry, um, you're going to find that I'm going to ask this question most times. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is, okay. this is my go to Stump the Chump question. What kind of tire is on this car? Um, let's see here. They, let's see. Did, 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 I'm right here. 15, um, 15 by 8s in the rear rally wheels. And they are drag radials. I'm trying to look and see what kind. They're the the Mickey Thompson drag radials. Okay. Uh, in like a factory type size on a 15 by 8. I'm sorry. I'm really, everything is spread out through the article. So I'm <laughs> trying to get you the info real quick. Yeah. That's all I got for you. Sorry. All right. No, that's good. That's good. That's not like, you know, a red line bias ply tire. <laughs> That's what's on the front, like a red line <laughs> radial that's supposed to look like a bias ply, but on the back okay. they have a uh, uh, the the Mickey Thompson drag radial on a stock steel wheel on a fifteen by eight. Right. Okay. Um. All right. So I need to come up with a quarter mile ET and mile per hour for that car, huh? Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. All right. I'm gonna go with eleven twenty six at one hundred and twenty four miles an hour. Oh man, you know, I would have guessed the same thing. Twelve thirty-two at one hundred nine point seventy-five. Oh wow! I know it's just it's a heavy beast. Yep the the big convertible, the big sixty-seven Firebird. It's a heavy beast. Yeah, that's not bad, I guess, for that time. And I mean, it wasn't really a horsepower monster, so no. But uh, it'll definitely pull your mobile home around. <laughs> 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 just latch it up, latch it up to the bumper there. Yeah, it's sort so, of an RV. One that shocked me too, Joe. When I looked through the specs, I mean, it's got a good cam, big carb. I mean, it's got the whole setup, but uh, you know, more of a torque monster than a drag strip horsepower machine with all the weight to the convertible. Right, right. So there we go. <laughs> That's our first first uh, installment of Stump the Chump. There'll be more in the future. All right, that was fun. Okay, our next topic. Uh, moving right along here is uh, listener questions. And this was one, again, we want you to send us your questions. We'd love to answer them and uh, and give you a hand with those. Joe, you've got, um, let's see, the first one picked out is from my man, Spaceman Don. Yeah, Spaceman Don from YouTube. He's uh, pretty active on our YouTube channel and I believe on our personal channels. Yep. Um, he wants us to talk a little bit about racing. He doesn't care if it's on the street or on the track. But uh, anything that may have happened during any of your uh, racing, you know, victories, uh, mechanical oh. failures. Oh, man. Oh, anything geez, come where, to mind for you? Where to begin? <laughs> well, you know, there's definitely there's a time. I think my favorite time of racing was um, when I had the 89 Mirage hatchback with the 4G swap. Yep. Oh man, that car was so much fun to take to the track because no one expected it. It just, you know, it just looked like a 
a slow little hatchback kind of thing. No one really knew what it was. Yeah. It, it wasn't loud or anything. And, and it just ran good. And at the time, it, you know, it ran good for what it was. And most people that I raced underestimated it. So, um, but there were some heartbreaks associated. I mean, there was one time at the track that, uh, I don't know, I broke a shift fork or something in it and, you know, <laughs> and of course it was at night. I've never broken anything during the day. It's always at night. Right. Um, but that, that was a good one. Um, just trying to think back. That was, that was, <laughs> those are definitely my fondest memories at the track was driving that car because I mean, there was just for whatever reason, that car baited like domestic cars in. I don't know why, but it looked like an easy target. Yeah. And yeah, how uh, could it possibly be fast? I know. And even when I moved uh, away and came up here, almost right after I moved into town, there was a domestic guy that sort of targeted the car <laughs> in a way, which I <laughs> yeah. thought was really weird, you know, because I'm not that kind of guy, like, you know, like super street race guy. But right. um, anyway, so after the Mirage sort of pulled away from him pretty good, <laughs> the car <laughs> the car had this strange... Um, aura about it and the reputation that no one wanted to go near it or anything it was just the fastest thing on the road <laughs> which definitely it was not but uh in that sense it earned itself a pretty cool reputation right away <laughs> yeah that's all it takes right there uh, yeah how about you joe <laughs> um well mechanical failures is, is what oh. drew my attention right away oh, like boy. you were saying sort of stuff that only happens at night when oh. you're grudge racing that sort of thing but um what sticks out to me as far as mechanical failures go is one time when I was at the track, I had my 1994 Eagle Talon all-wheel drive out there, um, and I was having sort of a U-joint issue at the time. I, I thought it would be good to do maintenance on my drive shaft and replace my U-joints, but unfortunately, I used part store brand U-joints, not OEM oh, Mitsu. Yes. Oh, very well, common mistake. Yeah, so trying to save a buck, and what I ended up with was uh, a broken drive shaft right out the launch, mm. and uh, I kind of, me and some friends, we pushed the car back to the uh, edge of the staging lanes, and I took a look underneath the car and realized what had happened, and um, since I had a welded differential in the car, it would run front-wheel drive just fine, so what I did was I went ahead and um, it broke uh, at the front drive shaft yoke, I, and I left the yoke in the transfer case, and I unbolted the drive shaft from the rear end and the carrier bearings, and I slid it out from under the car, and I slid it into the hatchback, and I drove the car back to the pit area. And the look on some of the people's faces that were in the staging uh, lanes. Oh wow! When I took my drive shaft <laughs> out and then drove away, they did not understand. They're like, what is that thing? What's that, Legos? What's that car made of? <laughs> oh, that is amazing. I I mean, I've never had something quite that heroic. I mean, the Talon broke, you know, I, I, I always wanted to drive a car to the track. To me, you know, there was just, uh, you know, something about driving a car a long way to the track and racing it and driving it home. You know, it's just, I don't know, it's just a measure of a car being built, you know, to a certain spec. If <laughs> yeah, you can do that. Yeah, street you know? car cred, you know? Yeah, there's some cred there, exactly. <laughs> and, um, oh my goodness, but there was just a run I had at Bristol that every time that, you know, it would claim something on the Talon. Uh, um, you know, the first time it claimed a shift fork and all I had was first and fifth gear and uh, or second and fifth whatever it was anyway yeah. uh, anyway it made driving home almost impossible but i made it the second time it split the diff and uh oh, cracked boy. the differential yeah I've, i got actually caught that on video and then the third time i took it um burnt the clutch and got kicked out anyway for too much mile per hour but yeah uh, I, i've had an interesting run at the drag strip it's been <laughs> I don't know if I've, I mean, I've had some fun, but I, it's been more misery than fun, I think, over the years. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, though. My initial, my initial memories are how fun it is, but then when I really dig deep, I find all of that stuff. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, but that's, that's racing. That's, that's, you know, that's why it's hard and, yep. And, uh, you got to really keep on it to get good at it. But, uh, yeah. So let's see. Any other aspects of that question? Um, tuning mistakes. Oh. <laughs> that's that's one that's one um i don't think any guy wants to talk about that there's a few topics guys <laughs> don't, don't want to talk about like 
like per, they're just too personal. That to me seems like it's kind of personal. Yeah. I totally agree. I totally agree. <laughs> Tuning mistakes. Oh yeah, there was that time I uh, fragged my air fuel, you know, my <laughs> fuel table and blew out my engine. I mean, no one who <laughs> would want to admit that. <laughs> it's like the the time I I took the fuel jet out of my wet nitrous kit. Yeah. Oh my And goodness. I forgot to put one back in, so it was just drowning the car in fuel, and I couldn't figure out what the problem was. Well, this isn't a tuning mistake, but because I've always been very conservative with my tuning, always, and um, I, I suppose it's resulted in me not maybe going as fast as I could have or whatever. But I've always stayed on that side of things. But let me tell you something happened. I had a Trans Am that I stuck a 355 in and a five speed, converted it to a five speed. Anyway, I had a nitrous um, plate on it. Right. I think it's 150 shot. Anyway, so I'm testing <laughs> testing it out. This is like third or fourth gear. Anyway, get on it. The uh, it's carbureted. The throttle, the you know, they use that little push nitrous switch. Right. Okay. The throttle opens up and hangs on the nitrous switch. <laughs> so the oh, nitrous boy. is engaged and it's stuck at wide open throttle. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, I don't. I still. I'm not exactly sure how I got myself out of that mess, but uh, <laughs> anyway, it all worked out in the end. But that was extremely terrifying. I don't. Like I said, tuning mistake or more of like an oversight, uh, installation oversight or something. Trying to trying to hurry or something. Probably right. right. You know. Not testing the range of motion there. Yeah, not to, maybe not enough. You know, like truly getting in the car and stomping the gas because that's what right. happened when you really stomp the gas. It kind of slid to the right a little, and then the switch <laughs> held up the. Oh, what a mess! <laughs> yeah. So, so that was a good question. I mean, gosh, I feel like I could talk all night about this one. Yeah, that was a good question, and uh, we couldn't really hit all the topics there. But no, uh, thanks no. for that question, Spaceman Don. Yes, and, thank you. Uh, Let's uh, hit on this second question real quick, Tom. Jeremy from uh, New England DSM. The he, New England DSM. The, the New finest, England DSM. The finest and possibly definitely longest standing DSM club. And a fine group of gentlemen, all with very fast cars, too. Yeah, yeah, that's a good group up there for sure. Um, Jeremy wonders, how do we get younger generations involved in the car culture? <sighs> That's a good question, isn't it? <laughs> it is. That you know that really made me think when I saw that, uh, <laughs> because you know everything I hear is that young folks aren't super into cars, and if um, you know, or in, or they're not super into driving and such, like the you, the, the generations coming up now. Yeah, yeah, I get not, that. They're not as you know their lives don't sort of center around cars as as yours and mine did. You know, I mean, it yeah, was my like, life when I was a kid. Yeah, it's such a it's such a weird question because I, I my question back to that is why 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 wouldn't they be in the cars? I don't understand. Uh, I know it's it's <laughs> it's hard for me to even wrap my head around, but I think uh, what we uh, need to do is get all of the younger people tablets and get them the Zinio app. Some sort of uh, <laughs> online multiplayer <laughs> racing. I, uh. Oh boy! Yeah, I don't know. It's um, you know, with the way cars are changing, it's funny. You got like almost like the horsepower wars are back, but yeah. at the same time, the technology is changing, and hybrid vehicles and full electric vehicles are becoming popular. Do you think there's ever going to be a huge performance market for electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles? You know. Part of me, I was just thinking about this because I saw a dyno video of some new Tesla thing and it laid down like oh, 12, yeah. I 1,200 saw foot pounds of torque. Dude, did you see that? It's like 1,200 <laughs> foot pounds of torque or something and they're yeah. like, oh, maybe they dynoed it wrong or this and that and it's <laughs> hard to dyno and it doesn't make any sound but the tires rubbing the rollers. It's very weird. Yeah. But I have to think you'll be able to hot rod those. But then on the other hand, they seem so complex. Um, yeah, that's true, but... That, but, when I think about that, it, it takes me back to like when I heard people saying, oh, man, these new fuel-injected vehicles, you can't <laughs> even modify them. Oh, good point. Good point. You can't even – Yep. and I, I remember hearing that over and over. And I remember even thinking that the first time I saw a DSM um, you know, come into our gas station. I remember just popping the hood and, and oh, what in the world? I mean you know, we did oil changes and things, and it looked like it was from another planet. You right. Know? That engine bay. 
<laughs> so yeah, I don't so, know. I guess uh, I guess we'll have to see what happens with that. I hope enthusiasts. I mean, I hope that fifteen years from now you can take an old Prius and hop it up. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, I think. I mean, a hybrid vehicle has a gasoline engine in it. There's no reason you can't do the same things you can do to, you know, any current gasoline engine but and i would think that an electric motor would be even easier to hot rod you know more voltage more power whatever yeah did you see steve down there he's got that super fast leaf (laughs) you know yeah yeah (laughs) i can't even picture these cars being fast like a nissan leaf or something i can't even steve's got the old leaf there he'll blow the doors off any of those 1200 foot pounds of torque teslas He's got a leaf blower, a blower on his leaf. He's got that leaf blower. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> oh, Man, I don't know. I, just I think had, that just had the a product idea. The the only the way to blower. really to really get these younger generations involved is is to show them, you know? Us old yeah. guys. Yeah. I remember there was a neighbor kid um who was getting sort of near driving age and he just would see me wrenching on my car and he kind of wandered over one day and he's like, what are, what are you always doing over here? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I said, oh man, you know, I'm just trying to build a hot rod, trying to find some more horsepower and everything. And he's like, you think um, you could take me for a ride? I said, well, you know, I don't know, you know, make sure it's cool with your dad or your dad can come or whatever. So we all three hopped in there and it, it changed. I think it changed his life <laughs> because from <laughs> then on, he was like super interested in cars and you know, his first car, he was asking me to help him wrench on it a little bit. And he was, you know, doing a couple of little things to it and, you know, painting little trim pieces and stuff. And yep. so I think you're right on the money. It's one of those things where it's your influence. If your dad or your brother or, or friend or somebody isn't sort of introducing you to it, you, it might just sort of float right past you there. Yeah, that was a good example you gave there, Tom. I think that's what you got to do. Yeah, and that was totally by chance. He just sort of was curious, but uh, some folks may not have that built-in curiosity. But uh, for me, it was always wanting to know how stuff worked and make making things faster. But anyway. Yeah, that's good. Oh, and I want to give a shout-out to somebody real quick. Thank you, Jeremy, for that question. That is one that's going to keep me thinking all week, I have a feeling. Um, I want to give a shout-out to Chris Mastin from Facebook, who sent an excellent explanation of what happens uh, to a runaway diesel, what causes that. <laughs> and he is a huge tractor pool guy. Um, he, that's his day job, believe it or not, is that, uh, building a tractor pooler. And, uh, you know, wow, uh, that sounds like fun. I know it sounded cool. He was describing it a little bit and uh, sent some pictures along and such. But I uh, just wanted to say hey to Chris and thank you for the explanation. And uh, and he said, uh, feel free to use him as a resource when we get to our tractor pool episode. <laughs> so whenever <laughs> that's right. slated for, I'm not sure. Yeah, thanks for that, Chris. We appreciate it. Uh, and we appreciate all the listeners that have tuned into the show today for episode four. I think we can wrap that up at this point, Tom. What do you think? I think so. This is episode four. Thanks for listening. All right, Tom, we'll talk to you later. And for everybody else, if you want to send us any questions or comments, please do so at our social media outlets or at our email, email at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. See you later, Joe. See you, Tom.